what's going on everybody welcome back to another video today we're going to jump into the topic 20 pieces of money advice for anyone who is in their 20s keep in mind this is coming from someone who is 27 years old so i'm not quite through my 20s yet but i have some very valuable advice for you and we're going to jump into it right now so there's no way i could remember all 20 of them off the top of my head so i've got my notes right here so if i'm looking down that's why coming in high at number one don't use other people as a way to measure your own financial success. That is a key. That was what my last video was about. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's called how to stop comparing yourself to others financially. But when you're in your 20s, it's easy to look at someone that's a little older than you or maybe even your same age that looks like they have more success than you because they have more things. That's not always the case. It's best to just look at yourself as your only competition and not look at other people's things or possessions as trophies or success symbols. And definitely don't look at other people's accolades as pressure for you to achieve something similar or above. That's a trap that is very easy to fall into and it can put you on a hamster wheel of years and years and years of frustration and getting into things that you're not even passionate about. It's best to just look at yourself as your only competition. Number two, you work hard for your money. Don't spend it so easily. Most people get paid only twice a month and some people only get paid once a month. And there may be a few people watching this video who get paid bi-weekly, so some months you might get paid three times, but the point is it's definitely not every day, which means you now have to manage the money between the first of the month to the 15th of the month before you get paid. So if you're spending money every single day on things that you probably don't need, that's gonna cut into what could be a nice nest egg that you could build for yourself and a nice savings account that you could build for yourself. It would be okay if you spent money every day and it really wasn't much at all. But what most of us do is we spend so much money that we don't feel is a lot of money because it's not at first, like maybe $20 a day doesn't seem like a lot at first until you get to the end of the month. And, and what we don't think about is we forget about our bills and all the things that are on auto pay. And now you're spending an extra $600 on top of all your other bills. And it's going to really squeeze you for the end of the month. So, so, so you're going to feel the pressure to be like, oh man, I hope my next paycheck comes a few days early. Because if it doesn't, ooh, my bank account is going to be in the negative. You don't have to go through that. And I'll give you a quick example. This looks so harmless from the outside. You go to the gas station, so you get some gas for your car. Okay, that's a necessity, right? Then, you know, you're a little hungry on the way to work, so you stop by McDonald's for a quick breakfast. Boom. Now you go to work. Oh, you forgot your lunch. So now you're going to buy something either at the vending machine or from the cafeteria at work. You repeat this cycle day in and day out for a five-day period. That's money that's draining your bank account. And that's probably something that most people watching this video have done already. With that said, number three, give yourself a limit every month of how much money you're going to spend on yourself guilt-free. It's probably one of the smartest things you can possibly do, especially when you're just getting started out. You may not really understand how, how much you spend every month can really impact your personal finances as a whole, but it can by quite a lot. And it can actually set you back for multiple years if you just spend blindly for your entire 20s. That's why I'm here to help you. So if you set a number, well, here's a rule of thumb because you're probably going to wonder like, what is the cutoff point? The cutoff point is 20% of your income every month. And I'm talking about your income after taxes. That's at the max, but I would say 10% or less should be guilt-free spending money for you. So if you're the type that likes shoes, if you like jewelry, if you like watches, if you like technology, if you like entertainment, whatever your thing is, you can set that number for every single month. And you'll kind of have the best of both worlds where you're actually holding on to a good amount of your money, but you're also spending a decent amount where you can actually enjoy life and still enjoy the things that you enjoy doing guilt-free. Number four, have at least five figures in your savings account by the time you hit 25. Now to some of you, this might sound incredibly ambitious, but you will feel extremely comfortable knowing you have at least 10 grand in your savings account. Every night you lay your head down, you go to sleep, you're gonna feel a lot more comfortable and a lot more financially secure. That's where financial security is built, having that discipline to even build that five figures. And I'm giving you five years to do it if you're 20 years old. And it's very, very, very attainable. Now, after that, you'll want to save anywhere between six to 12 months worth of expenses in your savings account as well. And that's going to be more building blocks on your savings, on your financial empire that you're starting on your own in your 20s. Number five, read as many books as you can about personal finances. There's a lot to personal finance that you're not going to find necessarily on YouTube. And if you do, you'll be rabbit holing through a bunch of videos. Um, I read a lot of books about personal finances and it's taught me a lot. I've read a lot that I agree with. I've read a lot that I disagree 
disagree with and I've applied to my life what I feel would be more beneficial for myself and my family and that's what I recommend that you do as well. And in August last year, I actually published my first book about personal finances. It's called The Wealth Journey. I definitely recommend that you check it out. You can find it up here. There's just so much you can learn about other people and other perspectives, both popular and you know not so popular books out there that can really teach you what you need to know about money, about debt, about paying off debt methods, about budgeting, about saving, about investing and making your money grow and making passive income and starting your own business. There's so much content out there that you can find in books and you could pay like $10, $20, $40 for a book. But the one thing that'll change forever as a result of that could be your education, your skill set, and your knowledge around personal finances. So any book you can get your hand on, I highly recommend. My current favorite personal finance book is Money Master the Game. So definitely, definitely check that one out too. Also real quick, here's a piece of extra personal finance advice that I'm putting randomly in this video. If you want weekly money advice from yours truly, hit the link in the description. I've got something very special for you. Once you hit that link and put your email in there, you will receive personal emails from me giving you financial advice and how you can take it to the next step financially. I hope you enjoy. Number six, keep your priorities straight when it comes to money. That may sound self-explanatory. That may sound simple. You might be like, well, duh, Reggie, like, I, I know, I know what I'm supposed to be doing, but a lot of people really don't, like they don't have their priorities straight. When Christmas comes around, they forget all about their bills, they forget about everything that they've ever worked for because they want to give presents, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know, at its surface, but when you overspend, there's a lot wrong with that, when you don't know how you're going to pay your bills in January. And God forbid you have family members who have birthdays near Christmas, and then after that you got New Year's Eve, you know what I'm saying? Like that's just, those months right there, th that time frame, that is a a money pit. Don't fall into it. But it's not even just for holidays. It's just for days throughout life. Days where you feel like you got to have Uber Eats or DoorDash or spend way more money than you ever should for some food that you could just, just go make at home or just drive to get. You don't have to do that. That's why, that's why I said a few tips ago to have a set amount of money to spend on yourself every month, 20% max. Number seven, don't let what others think dictate your financial decisions. Case in point, you start making a little bit of money. Let's say you're making 60, 70 K a year now. And then people start whispering in your ear, Hey man, wh why are you still driving that rusty, dusty piece of crap car? What, what, what's, what's going on with that? People think that you should have a new car fresh off the lot. People asking you, when are you going to buy yourself a house? People want to know when you're going to get new furniture. In my case, people were trying to push me into getting a master's degree and I, I just, I don't want to, I don't want to go back. But they're asking them, why don't you go back to school? Cause I don't want to right now. The investment does not make sense to me. The return that I could potentially get from that investment does not make any sense to me. Therefore I'm not doing it. And you have to judge for yourself. Does this investment make sense to me? And nine times out of 10, it probably doesn't, especially if the desire isn't even coming from you and it's coming to other people and they're basically pushing you and pushing you until you think that they're your thoughts. And so you believe that you thought yourself that you should go and get that car. You should go and get that house. You should go and further your education. Unless it's coming from you, it's not legit. I'm not saying don't listen to anybody, but only listen to people who have the results that you want in life. If they don't, you don't need to listen to them. Number eight, this is one of my favorite ones. Please pay close attention. Never miss a day of work unless there's an emergency or you're really sick. Let's talk about it. Never miss a day at work. Any day that you have scheduled to work, you need to be there unless something crazy is going on. I don't care if your girlfriend just broke up with you. I don't care if you stubbed your toe when you woke up this morning. I don't care if you're just having a bad day. You just didn't feel like going. You need to go to work every single day. That is the one way you can ensure that you get money consistently. Now, they have PTO and sick days and time off for things like emergencies and, and days that you want a mental health day. But that day needs to be scheduled in advance. It doesn't need to just be last minute, oh, I'm not going to work. Especially if you work an hourly job, you won't get paid any day that you don't come to work. I've seen too many people who have great jobs. I mean, really, really good jobs. Jobs that a lot of people around the world would love to have, the flexibility, the hours, the time off, all that stuff. Only working half the week and still don't even come to work half the week. Don't be one of those people. I'm sad today, so I'm not going to work. What kind of mess is that? People in their 20s nowadays are too soft. They can't even handle real life responsibilities, let alone a job on top of that 
I, I'm sorry. I just, I can't deal with any of that mess. And there's not a person in the world who can look at me dead in the face, seriously saying they want to make six figures or any amount of money that would be really good for them and their families, but they're not willing to show up to work every single day. If you have a poor work ethic, you're not going to have good money. That's just how it is. Number nine, don't let dating drain your income too much. I get it. You're young, you're dating. I understand. I understand. I've been through it myself, but I will tell you, don't spend, don't go too crazy with it. You know what I'm saying? Don't try to make too much of an impression. This is mainly for the fellas because generally, you know, I believe that if you're a dude, you know, you're going on a date with a woman, you need to be paying for the food. You feel what I'm saying? Like, I don't really care if anyone disagrees. That's just my philosophy. You can have your own philosophy. You're allowed to believe what you believe and I am allowed to believe what I believe. So don't come at me in the comments for saying this, but it's true. You, most of the time, if you're a dude, you're gonna be paying, you know what I'm saying, for the date. Don't go too hard on trying to impress your date. That's all I'm saying. Don't try to spend too much money because I'm telling you, because not every girl not every person that you go on a date with is going to be seeing you again after the first date. So if you mess around and spend $200, $300 on the first date and you never talk to them again, I don't want to hear you crying to nobody about it. I don't want to hear no crying. I don't want to hear anything about, oh my gosh, she flaked on me. I don't want to hear none of that. I told you not to go too hard on dating. I told you. And the reason I'm telling you this advice is because they don't make adults the way they used to make them. Adults used to walk around here marriage-minded. They weren't worried about their body count. They weren't worried about who can get free dinner from who. They weren't worried about all this scandalous mess. I said it, and I mean every single word. But it goes for both genders. They don't make women the way they used to. They don't make men the way they used to. A lot of men nowadays are soft, cowardly, don't have work ethic, don't have any oomph about themselves. And that's why most women don't want most men. That's just how it is. And a lot of women, they be doing that scandalous mess. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, like, this ain't here to offend nobody. I'm just telling y'all how dating dynamics go in 2023. And I don't really see it getting any better anytime soon. So unless y'all find somebody who y'all feel like is the one, I don't think you should go too hard on dating, especially if you don't even know if you're going to get commitment with them. And half adults in the world nowadays, especially if you're talking 20 to you know 27 years old, they have commitment issues anyway. That's what I mean when I say they just don't make them like they used to. We used to have things like loyalty and like morals and standards. Now all we have is one night stands and hookup culture and all this BS. I'm just I'm just keeping it real with y'all. That's why I don't think y'all should go too hard on dating, thinking you're so in love, thinking you like this person so much. They, I'm just saying, if they're going to be here in 20 years, sure. But if not, rethink your calculations with your money. That's all I'm saying. Number 10, figure out how much money you want to make per year and work to hit that number. A lot of times when you're in your 20s, you're not going to be quite making the amount of money that you want to be making. So the best thing you can do is set a five-year plan for yourself and then figure out what exact amount of money you would like to be making in five years. Does it have to take five years? No, but you want to map out a way and show yourself what you need to be doing in order to get there, what credentials, what skills, what attributes you need to have, and what you absolutely cannot be doing throughout that time period, and then work toward it every single day until you get there. And I guarantee you it won't even take five years. I did the same thing for myself. I was making 60K at 21. I wanted to be making double that. I hit that eh, four years later. So it didn't take five years. It still took a while, but every step of the way was worth it. And I mapped it out for myself and I proved to myself that I could do it. So that's gonna build even more confidence in you as well. Number 11, start investing as early as you can. Don't sleep on that advice. That's advice that I really wish that I would have gotten because there's a thing at work called a 401k that most people have that work a full-time job. If you don't have a 401k, you might have a 403b, you might have a Roth IRA or a traditional Roth. You have some form of investing options at your job, most likely. And you wanna take advantage of that as quickly as possible. And you could take a portion of every paycheck that goes into there. By the time you retire, it can be worth millions. I'm talking one, two, three, four, five million dollars 
because you need to retire with something and you need millions to do it. So that's the first part of the investing situation. But the second part is investing on your own outside of work that you want to invest on your own and you want to learn as much as you possibly can about investing and about the stock market because that is a money multiplier. That is how people become wealthy nowadays. That's how people become wealthy, and they've been getting wealthy from investing for a long time. Any average Joe, any random person in the world can learn about investing and then apply what they learn and then become wealthy within decades. So what if it takes a while to do it? I think it's worth learning how to do because passively, this money is going to keep growing despite you having a good or bad day, despite if you're sleeping or eating or running or jumping. It doesn't matter if you're sitting on the couch. That money is multiplying over time. I think it's worth learning how to do because the last thing you want to do is turn 60 and wonder where all your money is because you didn't make the smart decisions to invest and learn how to start investing. So check out those books. It may not be the most fun, entertaining thing to you know learn, but so what? You, you probably went through school. So, I mean, obviously you can do some boring things and learn something along the way. So I think it's a, a skill worth learning how to do. To me, you can make it fun because it's about something that can be life changing for you and your family. So whatever you got to do to make it fun, whether that's instead of reading the book, you listen to an audio book while you're like doing a physical activity, like running on the treadmill or do, doing a Stairmaster or doing some form of exercise, make it happen. That's what I did. But I don't want to hear the excuse of, oh, this is boring. Don't let boredom be the reason you don't reach the level you should for you, yourself and your family. That's disgraceful. Number 12, once you start making good money, don't let anyone guilt trip you into giving it away. There's going to be people who may need some favors from you. There may be families or maybe some close friends or people that you've known from a long time ago. They ain't hit you up in 10 years. That definitely happened to me before. But just remember at the end of the day, you can give what you want to give. You can give what you know that you're able to give without hurting yourself financially. There's no sense in you and the other person being broke because what if they can't pay you back and then they need some more from you? You want to just keep paying them? No. You can decide. You don't owe anybody anything in this world. Give what you're able to give and say no where you have to say no. Don't let anybody guilt trip you into saying, you switched up, you changed on me. I don't want to hear none of that mess. You don't owe them anything for their financial hardships. You don't. It's not your fault. Number 13, there's nothing wrong with doing what you have to do to make money. With a caveat, as long as you're doing something that does not compromise your morals, your values, or your integrity, there is nothing wrong with doing what you got to do to make money. So let me give you some examples. If you have to pick up another job to make extra money so you can provide for yourself and your family, go do that. That's what you have to do right now. That is fine. You may have other dreams and aspirations, but maybe you're not there yet. Maybe you just want to get to a point where you can actually be above water and support yourself and your family. Cool. Do what you have to do to get there. Don't let anybody shame you or make it seem like you're broke or you ain't nothing because you have to pick up another job or if you have to pick up overtime at work. There's nothing wrong with that at all. There's nothing wrong with moving back in with your parents and building yourself back up. You know what I'm saying? To build your financial freedom and your financial independence for yourself so you don't have to rely upon anyone else. There's nothing wrong with getting a roommate. There's nothing wrong with moving back in with your parents as you work a couple jobs and you just save up and save up and save up to a point where you can actually comfortably move out, have that five figures that I was telling you about in your savings and then be on your way. Sometimes we have to do what we have to do. And sometimes life deals us a hand that we feel is unfair, that we feel that we can't really work with that well. We may feel that other people have it better than us, but are you going to sit there and allow that to deconstruct everything you've ever worked for and everything you've ever wanted? Or are you going to take that hard to swallow pill and just say, okay, whatever this is the hand I was dealt, this is how I'm dealing with it and this is how I'm going to win. That's how you get to the next level. So you have to understand from an early point in time, no matter how fortunate you start off or no matter how fortunate you are right now, you always have to do what you have to do to get to where you want to be. Never, ever forget that. Number 14, live below your means. Whether you live with your parents or not, there's plenty of people who live with their parents that don't live below their means because they feel like, well, I live with my parents, so I don't have all these bills. So you just spend money like crazy. Don't do that. 
Sometimes it's better to live on your own to learn that lesson, but that's a story for a completely different video. I already done made videos about that. If you want to check those out, they will be up here. But in the meantime, this is what we're going to talk about. Living below your means. And to me, that means when you get out on your own and you're living alone, right? Look at how much money you make per year after taxes and compare that to how much money you'll be spending a month where you live at. I have a whole video on this about living below your means and how to properly live below your means and why it's important to be frugal at all costs, even if you make good money. And I suggest you watch that video right after this one. But you need to learn about something called the cost of living. So obviously you have living expenses like your rent, your utilities, water, electricity, stuff like that. But you also have stuff like your car, your gas for your car, groceries, house appliances, food, things of that nature. Think about this. You don't work as hard as you work to be one of those people who complains about how everything is going up. Like sure, people may say it. That doesn't necessarily mean they complain it. I've said it multiple times. Yeah, the prices are going up. Gas prices are more expensive now. Groceries are more expensive now. But I've been strategic about how I spend so that doesn't hurt my pockets like it'll hurt someone else who is unprepared. All I'm telling you is be prepared, my guy. Live below your means. Don't maxed out your salary every year. What that means is don't spend your entire freaking salary on every single bill that you have because that, my friend, is not living below your means. That is just making ends meet. Number 15, find at least one other stream of income besides your job. Now, this is something that I did. I'm not saying to know exactly what the heck you're doing with this other stream of income. I'm not saying that it has to replace your full-time income. I'm purely saying find another stream of income. Just prove to yourself that you can build another stream of income if you need it to and make it consistent. Like once you figure out what that one thing is, make it consistent. Like that's what I did. So at first I started a business for myself. So I played drums in college all throughout college. And I wanted to teach young people who wanted to play in college as well, how to do so. So I started a side business, made about an extra $200 a month. Now that business didn't last, but what I learned was, gosh, I am passionate about drumming. I'm passionate about helping people, but I'm not passionate about spending hours of my day preparing and then having guests over and then showing them how to learn the drums and things like that. I, I wasn't passionate about that. So I knew that I wanted to build something more passive. That was when I got more into like the video creation side and I started making personal growth videos, then financial videos. Then I made a YouTube channel. Then I got my YouTube channel monetized and then I wrote a book. You get what I'm saying? So I'm thinking of other things to build more income and it's passive somewhat at least. And sure, I'm not YouTube rich, but I've been making an extra few thousand dollars a year from my YouTube channel. And it's something I enjoy doing. It's something I'm passionate about doing. So why not? I just think it's a pretty cool feeling building something completely yourself. It doesn't have to necessarily be a YouTube channel or a book or, you know, any passive income stream. It could be cutting people's grass on the weekends or whatever the case is. It could be something, but I think it's really cool to build your own stream of income without necessarily relying on your job. Number 16, don't get in the credit card debt. And if you do, do so intentionally. So when I get in the credit card debt, I do so purely to build points for my credit card. I have a Chase Sapphire preferred card. And when you spend money on it, you know what I'm saying? You pay it back, you get points. It's pretty nice. And those points can buy you more things. It can buy you stuff like AirPods. It can buy you stuff like free dinners and things like that. So if I'm going about on my normal day, buying things that I would normally buy, like say gas for my car, groceries, or if I go out to eat, so I could use that card on things I was gonna spend money on anyway, so I'm not technically losing any money, so I pay that card back without having to pay the interest on it, then I get points in return, and those points then buy me free things. I mean, I think it's pretty smart. Number 17, pay off credit card debt with urgency but take your time with your student loan debt. Here's why. Credit card debt has a very high interest rate. It's like 17%. So if you owe like $100 and then you pay the minimum payment, and let's say the minimum payment is $25, now you have $75 left on your credit card, but because you didn't pay the whole thing off, now you get 17%. 17% of $75 is $12.75. So $12.75 plus $75 is $87.75. Yes, I just added it up just now. So that $25 that you just spent on the minimum payment has the exact same impact of $12.25. That is just sinful. More than half of your money just went toward interest. 
Just pay the whole thing off. Pay it urgently. Now, your student loan, that's the one thing that every financial influencer in the world screams and hollers that you need to rush to pay off. Why? It's like a 4% interest rate. Why, why should you rush to pay that off, but your credit card is sitting over here eating you alive in interest? Makes no sense to me. Do I think you should pay it off? Yes. Do I think you should rush to pay it off? Absolutely not. Just pay more than the minimum payment every single month for your student loans and you will pay it off in about 10 years. If you come into some money and you're able to knock it down a lot quicker, then by all means do that. But I think we should do things in our lives that make sense. And I think prioritizing paying off debt over saving money is one of the craziest things I've ever heard in my life. Especially if we're talking about student loan debt. If I'm telling you, you should build up a nest egg of six to 12 months worth of expenses and you say, no, I'm going to pay off my debt first, then do that. That's crazy to me. I myself have thrown thousands of dollars at my student loan debt before. And then I looked at my savings account and I was like, there's nothing in here. What if I lose my job in the middle of paying off my debt? And maybe that's an irrational fear thing, but... It's logical at the same time. It's much safer if you save while you're paying off debt and maybe you're not you know, throwing thousands at your student loans, but at least you're putting a dent in it little by little, but you're also building up a cushion in your savings account so you can have, I don't know, financial stability. So I'm gonna say about that one. Number 18, get a gym membership. Get into amazing shape. I don't think there's any logical reason in the world to be in your 20s and not be in shape unless you have like an underlying condition that inhibits you from doing so, I think anyone in their 20s should 100% be in physical shape. I think everyone in their 20s should want to be as healthy as possible. You have a long life ahead of you and you don't need to be walking around here miserable. So I think the gym is one thing that can keep you active and keep you accountable and you know look great. Like if I wasn't doing personal finance content on YouTube, I would 100% be doing fitness stuff because that's one of my passions in life. I think a gym membership is a very inexpensive thing that everyone can do at any age. And especially if you're in your 20s, I think you should double down on the gym. Number 19, get a primary care provider. By that, I mean get a doctor. Have someone that you regularly see. Have a physician, someone who can check you out. Make sure that you're healthy. Interpret your blood work to you that you should be getting at least once per year. Make sure your organs are working right. Make sure that you're feeling well. You don't want to just be running to urgent care all the time because not all of them know what the heck they're doing. Uh, your physician probably is going to know what they're doing. Again, something I had to learn the hard way. But your insurance that you have at work literally pays for that stuff. So if you don't go, you're literally wasting money. <laughs> so just go, just go. But on the other hand, you also need to have a dentist too. Make sure your teeth are healthy so you don't lose your teeth prematurely. Number 20, and this is a really important one. It probably should have been further up the list. By the way, this was in no particular order, by the way. Invest in life insurance because you're not going to live forever and your family after you is going to need something, you know what I'm saying, to survive without you being here anymore. And it's something that we need to think about early on. I didn't think about it till I was 24, so I went ahead and got it. But, you know, it's a really good decision because you're investing. It's going to grow over time. Um, I'm not going to tell you exactly which life insurance you should go for, do your research on that, but I'll tell you, I got whole life and I got term at the same time. And you'll be able to have a certain amount of coverage for your family when you're gone. They'll be able to bury you without having to cut into their assets and they'll be able to live a decent life without you. You really need to look into insurance, how it works, all that stuff, talk to somebody on the phone, do what you gotta do. But yeah, get life insurance. Why? Because it's cheaper the younger you are. So if you're younger, it's just like investing. The younger you are, the more upper hand you have when you start when you start investing. So if you do the same exact thing when you're investing in life insurance, the cheaper it'll be and the more it'll grow by the time you get older. That's my 20 pieces of financial advice to anyone who is in their 20s. I hope you like this video and I hope this helped. But anyway, that's the video for today. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Reggie Bryant and this channel is all about personal finance and personal growth so we can control you control your finances, and control your life. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.